welcome David Rothery. He's a professor of planetary geosciences at the Open University and currently the lead co-investigator for the Mercury Imaging X-ray Spectrometer, which is the only UK-led instrument on ESA's Bepi Colombo Mercury Orbiter, which will hopefully be launched in 2016. He's also co-leader of ESA's Mercury Surface and Composition Working Group, and his research interests centre on the study of volcanic activity by, by means of remote sensing and volcanology and geoscience in general on other planets. Um, he is bobbing out after this talk, but before the next one, to go to Sky News to talk about the recent earthquakes in Nepal. Um, but copies of his book, Planet, a very short introduction, will be available after this lecture. So, welcome. Thank you. Well, I'm pleased to see so many people willing to give up their lunchtime to hear about a planet which wasn't very, when I was a lad and growing up and wanted to be an astronomer, Mercury was the sort of least regarded planet really, it was very hard to see, we knew not much about it, we didn't think it would be very interesting, but actually it's turned out to be a, a fascinating place. And here's two, uh, two views of, of Mercury. Now, here's Percival Lowell's view of Mercury. Um, he drew canals on Mercury. <laughs> Utter rubbish. There's no... <laughs> He thought they were due to the planet cracking. He didn't think they were artificial, as he thought the canals on Mars were. But if you want to see a um, book with this in, or the handwritten notes of William Herschel observing a transit of Mercury in the 18th century, that and other rare manuscripts are on display in the RAS library across the way. I had a very happy half hour looking through those before I came over here. So I encourage you to go and take a look at those if you have time at the end of the talk. So Mercury, very hard to observe. I mean, there's no need to tell an audience like this that Mercury is the closest planet to the Sun. So as seen from the Earth, the distance that Mercury is from the Sun is never more than 29 degrees, something like that. We do not see it in a dark sky, especially from um, latitudes well away from the equator, such as, uh, as we inhabit. But you, you can see it. Mercury's on this shot here. This was photograph from Staffordshire uh, by a student of mine balancing his binoculars on a bollard and holding his iPhone to the, one of the eyepieces. <laughs> and, well, it's fine. Um, kind of if you can spot Mercury there. Um, that's Venus. There's Jupiter. And that one up there is Mercury. So it can be done. It was nowhere near elongation then either. So you, if you look in the right direction at the right time and you've got something to help you locate it, you can spot it. How many people have seen Mercury? Okay, so that looks like... How many people haven't seen Mercury then? Okay, I just wasn't sure how many don't knows we had. So about a, th a third of the audience or less have seen Mercury and two-thirds or more haven't seen Mercury. It is, it is tricky. Um, we're going to see very well when Bepi Colombo gets there. This is now going to be launched in 2017, not 2016, but it will still start its science operations April, May 2024. That's nine years from now. We'll be getting our first science from Mercury. It's got an iron drive. This is for European Space Agency mission, Mercury Planetary Orbiter. This stands for MMO, the Japanese orbiter, which will have a more eccentric orbit and probe the magnetosphere in great depth. So we're taking two spacecraft to Mercury up with, uh, with one iron drive, Bepi Colombo. Um, but most of my talk will be illustrated by data from Messenger, NASA's mission, um, which has recently ended, of which more in a, a short while. Here is the British instrument that Bepi Colombo will carry, MIX, the Mercury Imaging X-ray Spectrometer. There's a chair in the background for scale. This tube is more than a <coughs> metre long. That's an X-ray lens, that's an X-ray collimator. We'll have identical focal plane assemblies. We will use this instrument to map the abundance of elements on Mercury's surface with a spatial resolution of a few kilometres for the most abundant elements when the sun is flaring, and the course of resolution tens, hundreds of kilometres for less abundant elements when the sun is weaker. Because what we rely on for X-ray spectroscopy is for the sun's X-rays to hit the surface and cause the elements there to fluoresce in the X-ray spectrum, and we get very precise energies of X-rays from each different element. So that's what we'll be doing. I'll show you some X-ray spectroscopy data from Messenger in a while, and our data will be 
we hope, a lot better than that. This is a very innovative instrument, though, to have an X-ray telescope uh, like this. So here is Mercury in context to scale with the other terrestrial planets. I know the Moon isn't a planet, but to a geologist, it's very much like a planet. It's a rocky body with a... If it has a core, it's an iron core. So Mercury is the smallest of the terrestrial planets, but it's bigger uh, than the Moon. And it's also a very dense planet. Its density is about the same as the density of the Earth, which sounds unremarkable. If you take into account its smaller size and therefore its smaller mass, it's got a lot less internal self-compression than the Earth because of its weaker gravity. And it must mean its core is much bigger relative to its rocky outer part than is the case of the Earth. So Mercury's core, made of largely of iron, occupies 80% <coughs> of its radius. We knew all this before we had space probes going there because you can work out Mercury's mass from a, from a distance, even though it has no moon, which you'd really like if you wanted to work out a planet's mass. So missions to Mercury was Mariner 10, had flybys, only flybys, in the years 1973 and 74. We had Messenger, which had flybys, then was in orbit for four years, and it crashed a week ago last Thursday, about 20 past eight at night. And Bepi Colombo will be in orbit 2024 to 2025, a year's nominal mission. We hope to get several more years if it stays healthy. And Messenger was only meant to work in orbit for a year, and we got four and a bit years. And Bepi's a much bigger mission, bigger instrument suite. So we'll find out more, which is just as well, because there's a lot about Mercury that we realise we don't understand on the basis of Messenger. Um, it has a magnetic field, which traps particles around it, so there's a rich uh, exosphere around the planet, which I won't be spending much time talking about, because I've got less than an hour, and anyway, I'm a, a geologist. So here's some key facts for you. Mercury has a very large, presumably iron-rich core. I've already covered that, but its surface is very deficient in iron. We thought there wasn't much iron there before we got messenger there. Uh, now we're sure, because with x-rays, we've measured the abundance of iron, and there's only 2% iron. Wherever you look on the surface, it's about 2% iron. That's iron in any chemical state whatsoever, 2%, not much more. It's very, very deficient in iron, despite having this enormous iron core. But, completely unexpectedly, wherever you look, there's between 2 and 5% sulfur on the surface. Um, now, sulphur is an element which is moderately volatile, or pretty volatile, and it's very surprising to find it on the surface of a planet this close to the sun. And we'll talk about Mercury's richness in volatility as the talk progresses, because the big surprise from Messenger is how Mercury is rich in volatile elements of all kinds. And the core is generating a dipolar magnetic field, and the outer part of a core must be fluid, like the outer part of the Earth's core. It's an electrical conductor in motion. It acts like a self-sustaining dynamo, and it generates a magnetic field. Venus doesn't do this. Mars doesn't do it. The Moon doesn't do it. The Earth and Mercury are the only two terrestrial planets to generate their own magnetic field. And there's a compositionally rich and variable exosphere. It's too small a planet, too little gravity to hold on to an atmosphere. But there are uh, atoms escaping from the surface, which will bounce around and eventually, eventually leak away to space. That's what an exosphere is. The outer part of an atmosphere not bound to the planet. Mercury doesn't have a deeper part of its atmosphere at all. The exosphere sits on top of its solid surface. And there's a prolonged history of volcanic activity and fault activity. That's what I mean by tectonism. So here's a uh, 3D cutaway view of Mercury. Just to take you through it, the, the, there's an iron pore, silicate, that means rocky crust on the outside. Um, now, the mantle must be equally iron pore. If this crust is produced by partial melting of a mantle and volcanic activity, you don't change the abundance of iron very much. So, the rocky mantle must be relatively poor in iron as well. Um, we think there's an iron sulfide layer solidifying to the base of a mantle, which is being called the, the anti-crust. Uh, I, it's, but that term is now recognised on Google. <laughs> Two or three years ago, when I, I heard about this concept and wanted to find more about it, I Googled Mercury Antichrist, and it said, do you want to find out if Freddie Mercury is the Antichrist? <laughs> 
<laughs> sadly, there have been sufficient intelligent searches about Mercury now that you won't find that being offered to you when you Google it. You might have to look a long way down the list to find it. Anyway, the, the unsulfide anticrust. Here's the outer core. We think um, mixed with some sulfur or something to keep it fluid. It is convecting. That's what I've tried to indicate by the colour patterns. And then a solid iron inner core. It's very much like a cutaway view of the Earth, except we don't think we have an anticrust. And the rocky part is much bigger relative to the, the mantle. Um, OK. So just a little bit about Mariner 10, the view we had of Mercury before we got this wonderful messenger mission there. OK, it was launched from Earth. This is American, so that's the 11th of March, 1973. Swung past Venus, then it swung past Mercury. And that was going to be the mission. Swing past Venus to get you to Mercury. Job done, you fly past Mercury. Uh, but this chap here, Giuseppe Colombo, known to his mates as Beppe, said, hang on, if you do it right, you can put yourself into an orbit which takes twice as long to go around the sun as Mercury takes to go around the sun. That means... When you've flown past Mercury, Mercury will go around the sun twice. And then when you get back, there will be Mercury in the same place. So you can fly past Mercury um, every, every orbit and every, for every two Mercury years. And we, in fact, got three flybys of Mercury by messenger because, yeah, this chap, Beppe Colombo, realised just with, with a slight tweak, they could get multiple flybys for the price of one. And for all we know, Mariner 10 keeps flying past Mercury, but it ran out of attitude control gas and could no longer direct its antenna to the Earth after its third flyby. Um, sadly, though, even though we had three flybys, we saw the same side of Mercury each time. And that's because... I'm going to call for the video now, Gary. And that's because Mercury rotates... Um, exactly three times for every two orbits... So after Mercury orbited twice, its same face was facing to the sun. So the same half was sunlit each time. Let's just run a video, which uh, we did at the OU, to explain this three to two spin orbit relationship. This is the voice of David Mitchell you're going to hear. 60 Second Adventures in Astronomy. Number four, A Day on Mercury. No two planets act exactly the same, whether it's Jupiter spinning in only 10 hours, Venus spinning backwards, or Uranus tilting to one side. But Mercury is particularly strange. It takes nearly 59 Earth days to rotate, which might make for a pretty long day, but at least you'd have time to get things done. But while the days are long on Mercury, the years are relatively short. It travels around the Sun in just 88 Earth days. Now, until 1965, we thought Mercury span exactly once per orbit, which would mean that one side of it was always facing the Sun. If it spanned twice every orbit, its day would be the same length as its year, which would at least make calendars nice and simple. But it actually spins three times for every two orbits, which means each Mercury day lasts for two Mercury years. So while you might get a bit bored waiting for the evening, at least you'd be able to celebrate your birthday twice a day even if you had to share it with everyone else. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. You, you can find this online if you search for a day on, on Mercury. OK, so the post-Mariner 10 view of Mercury. Very large core, out of part fluid, because Mariner 10 discovered the magnetic field. That was a big surprise from Mariner 10, the magnetic field. This is, a, this is a classic view of the surface. It's a mosaic of lots of images. This is the Caloris Basin. It's an impact basin that's well over 1,000 kilometres across. Um, called the Caloris Basin because it's positioned at one of those places which has the sun overhead every time Mercury, every other time that Mercury comes to perihelion. So it's the hottest spot on the surface. So there's the basin. You can see lots of impact craters, but some smoother areas with fewer craters, but some wrinkles on them. And there was a debate about what those <coughs> smooth areas were outside the basin and inside the basin. Um, is it smooth because it's volcanic lava? Is it smooth because it's impact ejected that's mantled the surface? This has now been conclusively demonstrated to be volcanic from messenger data, as, as I'll show shortly. Um, uh, Chloris Basin, the name. Um, and another classic view from... Mariner 10. Here's a feature on the surface. The sunlight is shining from left to right. You can tell that from the craters. 
This is not a cliff, but it's a steep slope facing away from the sun. It's an escarpment. Here's a closer-up view of it. OK, here's a closer-up view. Um, it's evidence of contraction. It's a thrust fault, thrusting part of the surface over the adjacent part. These are called lobate scarps, or in Latin, a scarp is, is a rupee, singular or plural. This is called discovery rupees, after one of Captain Cook's ships. All the rupees are named after ships or expeditions that discovered stuff. This is Santa Maria rupees, this is an Endeavour rupees, and, and so on. Um, so this is evidence of global contraction early in Mercury's history. It had cooled down, and the surface had been thrust over itself. So that's the kind of the story we got from um, Mariner 10, which isn't wrong, but has been greatly elaborated by messenger. Oh, here's just a cross-sectional view to show you how you get one of those low-bait scarps. <coughs> Underground thrust, and that just pushes the surface up and over like that. So, after Mariner 10, people were thinking, well, how do we get a planet like this whose core is far too big for to just rocky outer shell? And the idea was, well, it's formed close to the sun. Maybe it was just so hot that, oops, maybe it was just so hot that rocky material couldn't condense in, a, in great proportions around Mercury. Or maybe it was hit by something. This is the gi a giant impact idea. And here's a computer model, the proto-Mercury and some impactor, with um, a, the blue inside is the metal core and the red or orange outside is the rocky outer shell. If you have the right kind of impact, and there is a scale change between the top row and the bottom row, you can leave your body be behind, um, which has been stripped of a lot of its rock and left with a relatively large core. And that would explain Mercury's strange rock to me metallic to iron abundance, but it wouldn't explain how it's so rich in volatiles, which we didn't know at the time. So this giant impact model for Mercury, or forming close to the sun and rock not being able to condense, doesn't work. Now we realise from Mariner, from <coughs> Messenger that Mercury is so rich in volatiles. So here's a Messenger mission um, being launched. And it's a very complicated graphic. Don't worry about it. But basically, it, it was launched in uh, April... 2008, flew once past the Earth, two Venus flybys, three Mercury flybys, and then it got into Mercury orbit, 18th of March, 2011. And uh, we had good science from the flybys. We saw parts of the planet we'd not seen before. We got even better science from orbit. Four and a bit wonderful years of orbital observations. Um, the orbit was a very... Um, elongated orbit, at the start of its orbital tour of Mercury, its periherm, its closest point to Mercury, was kept between three and 400 kilometres above the surface, but it was many, oh, I, think, I think it was 40,000 kilometres away from Mercury, certainly many thousand kilometres away from Mercury at apoherm. And the reason for that is, uh, being so close to the Sun, on the day side of Mercury, You've got the sun at one-third the Earth's sun distance on one side, and you've got a planet at 450 degrees on the other side. The sky is full of hot things, and you fry your spacecraft if you stay there for long. So it was put in an elongated orbit to take it away from the planet for most of the time, just on the basis of thermal considerations. And it was also an inclined orbit, polar orbit, uh, I mean, so its periherm was at high northern latitude. So it saw the northern hemisphere in much more detail than it was able to see the southern hemisphere. And that meant that instruments like the laser altimeter pinging down to the surface didn't even operate over the southern hemisphere. The range was, was too great. Uh, but it did mean it could probe the magnetosphere at all kinds of latitudes. It was crossing the bow shock at, uh, where the solar wind is slowed down to subsonic speeds by hitting the, the magnetoport. But there's a lot of good stuff about the magnetosphere. And there's groups of ions trapped around the planet, which I'm not going to um, uh, dwell on. But it was a great mission for studying um, the magnetosphere. Um, OK, as time wore on, the effect of the sun's gravity in the slightly asymmetric or non spherically symmetric gravity field of Mercury would cause the periherm, the low point, to drift lower. So we had to use fuel every so often to boost it to a higher altitude. Uh, that's just more of the same, really. So here you go. This is coming into the uh, third year of orbital operations. This top line is the latitude of the periherm drifting southwards from 
more, higher than 70 degrees to below 60 degrees north of the equator. Um, this other line here on this scale is the altitude of peri um, periapsis, it's labelled here. And you see it creeping lower, but here they use some fuel to boost it back up. And there were several orbital correction manoeuvres to boost the periherm back up. And it was going to crash on the 18th of March when they'd used all their fuel. And it was hy hydrazine was the fuel they carried, which they'd send to the rocket nozzles, ignite it, and it, it would burn and, and send out a jet of um, ions. And the reaction against that would give you an increase in velocity. Then they realised, hang on, how do we get our hydrazine to the rocket then? So we push it there with some helium. Why don't we, when we've used all the hydrazine, vent the helium as well? It's not a very efficient way of gaining some speed, but they vented helium through the rocket exhausts and got these orbital correction manoeuvres at the end. Uh, I think the last three, at least, are purely releasing helium, just <laughs> running on fumes, just to buy a few extra weeks in orbit. And you can see it was getting down to below 10 kilometres at times before we were boosting it back up. They were calling this the hover campaign here. It wasn't hovering stationary, but it just meant that the low altitude didn't drop any further. But it did crash um, April the 30th. It was sad, but it's wonderful to have had such a good mission. It stayed healthy. Almost every instrument was working very well right up to the end of the mission. And we got three more years in orbit than they planned for. Here's the last image that Messenger took, uh, less than 24 hours before it crashed. This does not include the crash site. The crash site was out of view of the Earth, out of direct line of sight, so there were no transmissions from Mercury as it came in for its uh, litho-breaking, they were calling it. You can't aero-break on Mercury, but you can use the planet's rock to slow you down. Um, it will have made a crater Something like that. <laughs> See the scale one kilometre across. The crater will be about 15 metres across with a mantle of quite bright, we think, ejector around it. And it'll be a challenge to find um, <coughs> the um, messenger impact site when we get Bepi Colombo there. It'll be good to do that if we can because how bright the ejector is and the rate at which it's fading back into the background will be useful information to us. But... It's a bit like looking for a needle in a haystack to find a crater that tiny on a, on a, within a search box of a few hundred kilometres on a, on a side. But we will try. OK, so some of the messenger results now. This is a graph of distance against the sun against the potassium to thorium ratio. Potassium and thorium are two elements which behave much the same within a planet but potassium is a volatile element and forms a refractory element. So um, planets that have been heated or subject to a lot of heat and violence in, during their birth should, shouldn't have much potassium. And here, this is Mars, high potassium form ratio, Earth, lower potassium form ratio, Venus, while overlapping error bars, but potentially a lower potassium form ratio than the Earth. This is the Moon, which is different for other reasons. We'd expect Mercury's potassium form ratio to be down here somewhere. Now, Messenger carried a gamma-ray spectrometer, which can detect both potassium and thorium from the natural gamma-ray emission, which they're responsible, and here are where the data fall. So, very early on in the Messenger mission, we learned from the gamma-ray spectrometer that Mercury has a very high potassium-thorium ratio. This is not a linear scale, it's a logarithmic scale. Um, something strange there. How is Mercury rich in potassium? And then add it to the fact that we've got this 2 to 5% sulfur at the surface, which I've already mentioned. That's measured by Messenger's X-ray spectrometer, using solar X-rays to cause the elements at the surface to fluoresce. 2 to 5% sulfur. Varies from place to place, but it never drops below 2%, as far well as you can tell. It's rich in sulfur, another volatile element. That is wrong. It shouldn't be like that. OK. Well, the work I do, I'm, I'm a geologist. Here, here is me with Becca, one of my PhD students. We're looking at images of mercury from Messenger on a screen. This is how we do a lot of our work. It's not just us. There's lots of people have been doing this. So let's start looking at some of the wonderful Messenger images. Here's a view from Messenger in colour. It's not very colourful. Perhaps you can see there's a hint of colour there. 
Um, the area is uh, roughly 1,000 kilometres across. It's at moderately high northern latitudes. And I hope you can see that on the left and in the lower part, it's more heavily cratered, upper right, fewer craters. So this left and lower part is ancient, heavily cratered terrain. This is what you would call smooth plains. But of course, there are plenty of younger craters superimposed on it. Uh, so it's fairly old, even so. But there's certainly an age difference between the two areas. There's also a compositional difference borne out by the colour. Mercury is not a colourful planet. I'm now going to exaggerate the colours for you to convince you that there is a colour difference between these two terrains. So here we go. So we've got these red plains here and the, the bluer, more cratered area. So there is a compositional difference that goes along with the age difference, which we can infer from the fact there are more craters here than there are over here. So this is Mercury's oldest crust, as far as we can tell. It's not like the lunar highlands, though. We're pretty convinced now, I'm jumping ahead of myself, we're pretty convinced that this is volcanic. It's not a flotation crust that's risen to the surface of the magma ocean, like the anorthosite that forms the lunar highlands. We're seeing nothing like that on Mercury. This is just an older version of this stuff, we now think. But let's look at this stuff because it's easier. But if you can see, um, well, did, remember I pointed out on the Mariner 10 images, we don't know if the planes are ejector that have mantled stuff or are they lava flows that have mantled stuff. Well, there's evidence here that helps convince us that it is in fact lava. And I'm looking up there, but there are other places as well where you can look at this crater here, it's rim here is intact, but over here it's been almost buried by the, sort of, by the red orange plains forming material. Um, there are other examples, there's things that look like flooded crates. Let's look, at, let's look in detail at that. So into that box there, I'm going to show you a high resolution black and white view of that feature. Here it is. So these are nice young craters superimposed, but the feature of interest is this circle here. This is what's known as a ghost crater. We know them on the moon, we know them on Mars. It's a crater which was there before this region was flooded by this smooth stuff, which is volcanic lavas. And as lavas cool down, they contract thermally, they degas and void spaces collapse, and the surface drops down. So the rim of a buried crater can re-express itself on the topography, and that's what's happened here. And you see it's cracked, nice little radial crack pattern inside the basin. Let's show you this idea of forming a ghost crater in cross-section. So here's a cross-section through an impact crater, which would have had a central peak at this size, but the central peak would have been a lot lower than the, uh, the rim. So that's the, the cross-section of the terrain before flooding by lava. Here come the lavas, floods everywhere, and then cooling, contraction of, and subsidence of the lava surface. That's what happens. And these, this is the rim of your ghost crater, as seen on that image. So that's how ghost craters form. You can't really do this with crater ejector mantling the surface. So there are other features which convince us it's lava. The plains on Mercury are formed by outpourings of, of volcanic lava. OK. Uh, these are two identical views in exaggerated colour. The area I was showing you before was somewhere up here. You see the, the, the red volcanic northern plains and the blue more ancient terrain. I'm going to show you the only data I've got with me today from the X-ray spectrometer on Messenger, which um, was fairly low resolution, especially over the southern hemisphere, where, remember, Mercury's orbit took it further away. Uh, but it is a way of mapping the ratios between different elements. And this is what, how we know, for example, Mercury's poor in iron. So I'm going to fade in two um, element abundances. I think it's magnesium silicon and aluminium silicon, but it will be labelled. So just watch while I fade in the, the co-registered elemental ratios. Magnesium silicon, aluminium silicon. There you go. And what can you see here? Well, you can see that the northern plains and the middle of a calorous basin, let's just take that out, Chloris Basin you saw on the Mariner 10 view is full of these red lavas, and here's the northern plains. Those, that, that area, both those areas ha are high in, uh, no they're not, they are low in 
magnesium relative to silicon. So that, okay, you expect the planes to be a bit different to the other areas. But look at this area here that's been outlined here in red. We call this the high magnesium region because it's high in magnesium. That doesn't fit with anything. It's here. You can't spot it in any other way. But elementally, it has this strange high abundance of magnesium. That's something we don't understand. It might be a buried impact basin expressing itself somehow. But we're, we're puzzled. I just don't want to dwell on this other than to point out but when you look at the elemental abundances, some features map well with features that you could see already, like the fill of the Chloris Basin or the Northern Plains. Other things, like the high magnesium region, you wouldn't have suspected without the maps of the elemental abundances. I don't think Shoshana Veed is in the audience, is she? The author of this paper from Nature was going to come along either today or this evening. So maybe she'll be here this evening. Um, it's great work that was done by the Messenger team on this. And you see, sadly, it's so blurry in the south because the spacecraft was so far away that the spatial resolution of the data drops to an enormous scale. OK, let's now look um, at some uh, more obvious geological features on the surface. Here are two global views uh, made when there was a, a, color, a stripping colour that was missing. I'm going to show you this region up here uh, in, in some detail. I'm going to be looking at this region here where there's this shadowed hole in the ground surrounded by this, I'll call it red because we tend to say red, it's not very red, it's orangey. This bright red deposit which has a diffuse outer edge. There's a smaller red deposit with a diffuse outer edge here with no discernible <coughs> hole in the middle and this is sitting in this double ringed crater here and that's where I'm going to begin I think. Yeah, that's the right. Maninoff Basin, here it is in high resolution, black and white. That was that red deposit. So it's a peak ringed basin, which you get at a certain scale of impact structure. The middle of it has been flooded by something which has breached this ring and flooded outwards to fill the outer part of the outer ring. That's an eruption of lava, which must post-date the formation <coughs> of the peak ring basin and you can count the craters on it and work out that this was quite a long time after the peak ring itself was formed. So you form the peak ring basin, then you have a volcanic eruption, and then you have the formation of this red spot here. Can you see the nice low-bait lava flow front there? It's there on the colour view as well. So that's good evidence of, uh, of lava flooding a peak ring basin. Now we're going to go up to here, so there's that feature 50 kilometres across. It's not an impact crater. It's the wrong um, shape. It's also too deep relative to it, its size to be an impact crater. We've seen it in very great detail. Um, this structure on the floor and one of the very recent images from the low, low altitude campaign at the end shows it obliquely here. We're looking at the walls. This is a feature that's about four kilometres deep. That's deeper than the Grand Canyon. Now you can see some layering in the exposed parts of Mercury's crust. I see some evidence of landslips as well. But we can also see some little impact pits over it. So it's not an incredibly young feature. It could easily be a billion years old. Probably is more than a billion years old. Uh, but what a wonderful feature. And we think this is a... Uh, a uh, a volcanic vent. It's a site of explosive volcanic eruption and the red deposit around it is the stuff that was exploded out of it. It's a pyroclastic deposit. Um, the first one that was studied in detail is in the Caloris Basin. I'm going to come back to craters like this with these strange pale deposits on the surface in a while. Let's just pan south. Here's a view from orbit of this feature here. Again, the wrong shape for an impact crater. It was described as a kidney-shaped vent <coughs> at the time. This is as it was seen by flyby. We know now it's not kidney-shaped. You can see, well, they thought it was kidney-shaped. That looks like the edge of it, yeah? There's a scale for you. Um, that feature sits here, and in red are all the volcanic vents around the Caloris Basin. They're mostly near the edge of the basin, where the lava filling the basin is at its thinnest. So this is the one we're going to be looking at in detail. And here's a colour view. You can maybe make out the bright red deposits 
surrounding. I know the whole floor of the basin is red, but these vents have brighter, redder stuff surrounding them. So that's what we're going to look at. So there's the kidney-shaped vent, red spot free. It was catalogued as seen during flyby. And uh, seen from orbit, at much higher resolution. Here's the edge of it. Look at that wonderful texture in the, in the middle part of it, which is fresher looking, possibly a younger surface. And it still looks kidney-shaped. But when we see it with the sun low in the west, we see there's another depression there. So the actual outline of it um, comes round and further out this one. It's not apparent with the sun in the wrong part of the sky. This is why going in orbit is important. You can see things under all kinds of illumination conditions. So here's our, here's our kidney shape then, which is no longer kidney shape. What we do know is it's an amalgamation of several different holes in the ground. Maybe one at the west is the oldest, then this, then these round here, and then one, two, three in the middle. We've had a whole series of, we think, explosive eruptions on sites which have just migrated to and fro a little bit. And that's not unknown on the Earth. Here's an example. This is a volcano Lascar in the Andes. Oops. Crater on the west, actually migrated eastwards and then came back towards the middle. So that's what's known as a compound volcanic vent. Migration to and fro over a few kilometres. And it's happened on Mercury too, just it's happened on the Earth. Um, We've got cross-sections through this, but they're not as good as the cross-sections through that vent. So I'm going to show you that vent there in cross-section. Um, this is vertically exaggerated. There's a horizontal scale here of 140 kilometres and a vertical scale of a couple of kilometres. But they are not volcanoes. But, well, they're not mountains. They're very, very gentle edifices. But the, the vents in the middle are well over a kilometre deep. And I told you that previous one was three or four kilometres deep. This isn't quite that deep. But they're steep. They're, they're not flat bottom either. They slope all the way down to the bottom. So that's the nature of them. Explosive volcanic vents, which are quite deep holes in the ground. And how do you get an explosive volcano? Why does, doesn't it just ooze out lava? Well, it must have gas in it. There's some dissolved gas in the magma, which as the magma rises towards the surface, and it therefore experiences less and less pressure, the gas comes out of solution and drives an explosive eruption. We don't know what this gas phase is. Could be sulfur, could be methane, unlikely. Could be water, unlikely. Could be carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide. There's something volatile coming out of solution. Another independent line of evidence that mercury is rich in volatiles to give you these explosive eruptions. And here's the youngest explosive eruption site we've found on mercury. Um, here's a crater. There's a scale bar 10 kilometres. Here it is in colour, and you can see there's a red pyroclastic deposit uh, concentric around the northern rim of the crater, which has got two <coughs> holes punched through it. This vent here, that's a volcanic vent like the ones we were looking at before, that's punching through the terracing inside this crater. So that volcanic vent must be younger than the crater. This crater is the youngest morphological age class of craters we've got on Mercury. It's almost but not quite got rays still surviving, but the freshness of its terracing tells us that this crater is about a billion years old. So this volcanic vent is younger than about a billion years old. So we've got explosive volcanism here a billion years or less ago. That's a lot younger than most of the activity on Mercury, and that's a surprise. Okay. Here's the Caloris Basin again, and I mentioned some of these craters with bright, pale blue deposits within them. They were called bright crater floor deposits at first. There you go, bright crater floor deposit. I remember puzzling over these with, with Patrick Moore when we did a Mercury flyby edition of, of, of Sky at Night. We didn't know what the heck these things were produced by. Uh, now we know, well, no, we don't know. We know morphologically what they are. And we know it's to do with volatiles. We still don't know what the volatile is. Um, see these bright blue patches, when you look at them in detail, um, there are steep-sided, flat bottom depressions all over the place. The top 10, 20, 30 metres of surface has been removed. Now, there's no wind on Mercury because there's no atmosphere. The stuff isn't falling through into a hollow interior or anything like that. It's just turning to vapour and dissipating away to space somehow. 
probably got some more detailed views of hollows. That's perhaps more convincing. Just ignore the little arrows. But these hollows here, whole fields of them. And these are young features. You don't see impact craters superimposed. This hollow, process, hollow forming process is going on today. It's a real mystery, but it's something volatile that's escaping to space. Uh, we don't know if it's sulfur that's responsible. Probably not. We're, to be honest, mystified as to what is happening here, other than that something is dissipating to space to leave these hollows behind. So how do they form? The loss of at least a moderately volatile substance. It's removed without melting. You don't see channels draining away from these. Uh, so it's going to vapour. Is it just sublimation straight from solid to vapour due to temperature? Is it some kind of space weathering process? You know, ultraviolet photons breaking chemical bonds? Is it sputtering micrometeorites breaking bonds? Um, or is it being strip mined by aliens? You know, <laughs> any of these is as good as the other at the moment on the basis of, uh, of the evidence. Um, the nearest analogue we have is the Swiss cheese terrain around the South Polar Cap of Mars. Uh, here we know it's calm dioxide ice which is subliming away. I used to think I mean, Swiss cheese terrain, terrain is what this is called by everybody. I used to think that was a pretty poor term because to me this is a Swiss cheese. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's got bubbles in it. That's, but actually when you go to America and you're given Swiss cheese, you're given a slice like this. <laughs> so that's why it's called Swiss cheese terrain. It's a, it's a, it is an appropriate analogue with processed sliced cheeses. So I'll, I'll try and wind up fairly quickly now and just talk a little bit about the tectonism of mercury. There's a region here which uh, contains a nice low bait scarp that was seen on the first flyby, which colleagues uh, and I have made a study of. Uh, here it is seen in more detail. It's called Beagle Rupees. I told you all the rupees are named after ships used on voyages of discovery, and this was named after HMS Beagle. And that's a very appropriate name because it was discovered 150 years after the publication of The Origin of Species and 200 years after Darwin's birth. So it was great to get this name, Beagle Rupees. Um, so that's all the faults that we, we would draw on this. I'm just going to rattle through these slides now. This low bait scarp will be evidence of, of a compression of the surface, movement of the terrain on the right off towards the left to form the scarp. But if, if the movement is at right angles to the front of the scarp, it's got to be oblique to these sort of sideways wings of the structure. So it's not just compressive movement. There's some sideways slip if you look at different parts of the feature. This is a complex fault, much more complex than the low bait scarps that were seen by Mariner 10. So let's look in detail at the front here. Um, you can see there's a crater here that's been overridden by the scarp. Can you see that? So this crater was there before the scarp formed. And we can use that as a measure for how far the scarp has moved. And it works out it's moved by about three kilometres. Um, actually, we've got another view of it with the sun in a different part of the sky. And you see it's actually a younger crater that's superimposed on the scarp. And here's the older crater, which has been overridden. So we had that <laughs> crater forming, then the scarp, then this younger crater. And we can look down the sides here, and we've got uh, a line of um, ejector sculpture here, and the scarp cutting across it. And try and see any kind of offset of this original linear feature by the fault movement. It's very hard to spot. The sideways slippage across here was less than a kilometre. I'm sorry I have to rush through this. And then the bottom end of the structure, where it peters out, there's a whole succession of younger and younger thrust, one cutting across another. So that's the ends of a beagle rupee structure, but then compression continued and formed that thrust, but that was overridden by this thrust, which was overridden by, quite an easy one to see, that thrust. So we see the compression carrying on jamming and the motion being transferred further back down the structure. So here it is in, in cross-section. And what does that mean in terms of how much rock has moved? Well, because it's a curved structure, all this lot must have moved, but we're looking then at this area here, that lot must have moved as well, and maybe that much back there. So two or three hundred kilometres of crust has slid over itself during this crustal shortening process, which is very different to what we had on Discovery Rupees, which is a much simpler structure. 
I'll just wind up by showing you some big impact basins who, which have been filled by lava, which has then been frosted. Um, there's lots of them around here. This one here was called B38 catalogue, but I'm, I'm actually going to get it named a Nyrin after a Welsh bard. <coughs> here it is, and you can see uh, a basin largely filled by lava, but the edge of the basin has become a, a frost fault just round there. So I haven't got time to dwell on this. There's a lot of fascinating stuff going on with the interplay between flooding of basins by lavas and then planetary contraction causing frosting round the edges. Oh, it made the news in Welsh when we gave it a Welsh name. So. <laughs> no such thing as, as bad publicity. It was also published in, in English. So there's our cross-sectional model for what's happening. A big frost at the base, uh, in the basement, um, disturbing the volcanic fill of an impact basin. And there's a couple more up here, which are very hard to see when the sun is high in the sky. I got this one named Hafiz after a, a Persian poet. But when the sun is low in the sky, you can see the structure much more clearly. So it's, it's, to my mind, it's an absolutely fascinating planet. And those two thirds of you in the audience have never seen Mercury, 9th of May next year, Mercury's transiting across the sun. Uh, don't look at the sun unaided, and you will need to magnify the image anyway or use a solar telescope. Uh, you'll see Mercury doing this. It's 1212 it's, uh, to 1942 BST, perfectly timed. We're going to web stream it from space because we've got satellites in space that will see this even if it's cloudy. There's a chance for any of you to see this either on the web. Who belongs to an astronomical society? Well, get, get your society out there with its solar telescope showing this to the passers-by on the high street. I'd like everybody to see Mercury because um, we're going to have a website at ESA drawing attention to the transit, providing the web streaming of the transit, and also all kinds of links to educational outreach stuff about how fascinating a planet Mercury is. I hope you agree that there is a lot about Mercury that's exciting. Stuff we don't understand, like how it's got all these volatiles. And hopefully Beppe Colombo will, will tell us more about this. If you want to know more than I've been able to fit in, there's my very expensive book with Springer here. This is, this is 50 quid. It's a, it's, a, it's a serious book, but that's academic publishers for you. I, I have got, um, though, uh, there's my students. But there's a, I've got a much cheaper book, six quid, very short introduction to, uh, to planets, which I've, I've got with me. So anyway, I hope uh, that Mercury, the unregarded planet, you realise now is a fascinating place, and there's a lot more we'll find out about it in nine years' time when Beppe Colombo gets there. Thank you for listening. I thought there were no plate tectonics on any other uh, planets in our solar system other than the Earth. So how do you get this, um, these vents forming, and the, like fault lines, okay. without te plate tectonics? Well, it isn't plate tectonics. Plate tectonics is when you've got the outer shell of the Earth being mobile and moving vast distances and one plate going below another. All we're seeing here on Mercury is the planet firmly contracting by seven kilometres in radius and one bit of the surface having to be forced up over the other. So it's not really divided into surface plates. And the volcanic activity is not related to the, the melting which drives the volcanoes isn't related to the surface faulting in the same way that it is on the Earth. What causes the contraction? Uh, Mercury has cooled down since it formed, as indeed has the Earth. But the Earth's cooling it, crack, you know, contractional features are all obscured by the fact we've had plates going down one below another, so you don't see it. But Mercury has just firmly contracted by seven kilometres. We can work out the shortening, but we can observe at the surface, and it's seven kilometres radius. There's another factor which contributes to it. As you know now, Mercury spins very slowly, it's probably spinning a lot faster, you know, 24, 10-hour day or something like that, 10, 24-hour day. It's now, day is now 56 Earth days for one sidereal rotation. That's slow. It would have had an equatorial bulge when it was spinning faster. When the rotation got slowed down, that equatorial bulge would have collapsed. That will also give you some frosting around the equator.
but it's mostly thermal contraction. Probably a, a naive question, but how do the camera lenses on the probes cope with the intense heat? Is there some very heat-resistant glass that's been developed? That's a good question. I don't know what the lenses are on the optical cameras, but um, they did what they could to keep everything um, cold. Marina, so Messenger had a heat shield, which was always kept between the spacecraft and the sun. And it was a ceramic heat shield, and there was that much gap between it and the body of the spacecraft, so it was kept cool by being kept in the shade. But even so, with a hot planet, which you're looking at, you're going to get hot. But so we did have to allow for the thermal environment. And not just the optics, the electronics yeah. don't work if, if they get hot. So you have to be cooling as much as you can. There were radiator panels on Messenger that, that were radiating the heat away wherever they could. Do you think they took pictures really <coughs> in quick gaps and then closed the gap again and to cool no, it? No, the aperture was kept open all the time. So it wasn't the case of opening and shutting, uh, protecting the lenses. They were exposed to whatever was coming at them all the time. What's the temperature on the surface of the Swiss cheese area? OK. Um, the... Day, the noon time temperature on Mercury at the equator uh, is 4 to 450 degrees centigrade. Now, the hollows on Mercury, we call it Swiss cheese on Mars, on, on the hollow forming areas on Mercury are not at the poles like they are on Mars. They tend to be mostly at low latitudes. So we're in the hottest parts of the planet, but not exclusively so. So... Um, we don't know why the hollows occur where they do, but it is in hot areas. Could you just tell us, uh, we see a spaceship setting off with lots of bits. Could you tell me what happens when it arrives? Does it all go around together, or is it a... Does oh. each bit separate off and get a little push to a different orbit. You're asking about Pepe Colombo, especially for me. OK, there were sort of four bits on the graphic. I won't go all the way back. What, what powers us to Mercury is the Mercury transfer module. That's the thing with the iron drive. And that is firing all the time to slow us down as we're falling in towards the sun. The whole trick of getting to Mercury is to slow yourself down when you arrive there. Um, that drive bit gets us into orbit about Mercury, then the, the Japanese vehicle is detached and goes into a free flying orbit. And the, and the, so that's one item disposed of. During flight to Mercury, the Japanese thing was in a, a big sort of ho hollow conical thing. That's the sun shield, which is jettisoned, got rid of. because You don't no longer need that to shield it from the sun once we're at Mercury, because the Japanese orbit is spinning, which helps keep it Cool. One side doesn't face sun all the time. Then the Mercury transfer module with the iron drive manoeuvres us into a more circular orbit and detaches MPO, the European orbiter, the Mercury planetary orbiter, gets that into its working orbit. Then we detach the Mercury transfer orbit and it's, it's jettisoned. I don't actually know what we do with that, whether it stays in orbit about Mercury or whether we deliberately crash it. So there's two orbiters doing science, one sun shield, which is redundant once we get there, and the Mercury transfer module, which we separate from when we've got the second spacecraft into its working orbit. Yeah? Oh, fingers crossed, yes. <laughs> Would there be an advantage to send humans there? I know it's going to be very hot, but... Uh... I don't think it would be a great place to send humans for a long time. There are places on Mercury that humans could operate. I mean, I didn't mention the permanently shadowed craters near the poles, because Mercury's orbital axis is not inclined to it. Mercury's rotational axis is not inclined to its orbit, so there are shadows that are permanent in craters near the poles, where there's ice, water ice, trapped. And just at the fringe of those hollows, 
Yeah, there'd be an equitable temperature. You could even set up a band base there, but let, let's do it on the moon before we go anywhere <laughs> complicated like Mercury. Last question. Uh, to what extent is the surface of Mercury heaving towards the sun when a particular point of the surface points at the sun? Does the sun's immense gravity pull that bit towards it and then subside? If so, has it been measured? Uh, okay, talking about the solar tides on the surface of Mercury, it hasn't been measured. That's one thing that we will attempt to do with the um, laser altimeter that we've got on, on Bepi Colombo. But Mercury's tidal bulges are fairly fixed. It, this 3 to 2 spin orbit coupling means that for most of, for, for, for the part of its orbit when Mercury is near perihelion, its tidal bulge, if the lectern is the sun and I'm Mercury, and this is my tidal bulge, the tidal bulge faces the sun as I'm rotating. Then when I go further away and I'm travelling slower, the bulge rotates more quickly. Next time I come round, it's the tidal bulge on the other side that's facing the sun. So there's two tidal bulges which don't have to migrate very far. You always get two tidal bulges, one facing, one on the opposite side, and they take it in turns to be the one that faces the sun. And this is how it's kept locked in this three to two spin orbit state. Um, so the bulges aren't changing height or position very much, but we do want to try and measure it if we can, because that will tell us about the internal mechanics of the planet. Um, I think we have to leave it there for this afternoon so that Dave's got a few minutes to. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone wants to come and, come and get a sign